Notes from the Upper West Side, a novel by Dan Wrench. Chapter 127, Rattlesnake Parking Lot. So it seems to me, looking back on it, that a buttload of panicky mental activity was coursing through my brain while bang riffed on the photo showing me with a metal finger up my nose. (laughs) Or maybe part of that memory is an illusion. I can't really say how much mental activity was coursing through my brain right at that moment while the gang was laughing at me, and how much of it I added later while remembering the humiliation. Captain Fink is funny that way. I know for certain the image of Parp was in my head, and I also know for certain that me remembering how much I hated him was in there somewhere. And something else I know for certain, I kept hearing these words in my head, My cloud is gone! Wiped out! My entire capital of cool from being the actor guy and the model guy, and the factory guy, and some other guy I can't remember right this sec had been driven out of existence by a single photograph. My indomitable savoir-faire had shriveled into a spindly geezer and skulked away hissing, like a vampire in the presence of a vibrating metal crucifix. I thought I might be able to salvage some credibility by ripping open one of the mirror trim packs and sticking the metal trimmer in my nose and holding it there while saying something stupid, like a clown in an Italian circus. You know, going with the audience flow. But, come on. People might start laughing with me. But Italian circus clown isn't a guy chicks want to blow. Unless he also has some semi-comical cognitive issues, like the guy played by Anthony Quinn in La Strada. But I wasn't Anthony Quinn. I was a plain vanilla buffoon. And Cammy who'd been trying to get back at me ever since I pointed out to her that the bee in dumbass is silent. Now she just stared straight into my eyes and laughed like a Halloween witch. (laughs) Like she wanted to see in my face how much it hurt, like she couldn't help herself. I love it, she howled. Oh my god, (laughs) this is fucking perfect. (laughs) Fonda was laughing too. (laughs) But then she saw the look on my face and got all maternal. Or fake maternal. I can never tell the difference. Ah, she said. And she pulled my face down into her tits for a second before pushing it back out so she could look in my eyes. Poor Polly. Not fun, huh? She turned around to the gang. Hey, she shouted. Paul is not having fun here. They all got quiet and started saying things like they didn't mean to hurt my feelings and whoops our bad. I can't remember their exact words because right that second, right when Fonda was pushing my face back out of her tits, it dawned on me that this was the kind of reaction I could expect for the rest of my life from anyone who knew about this Majelko packaging. Cackling derision followed by pity. I could either never bring it up to anyone, or I could live with being the Italian circus clown. Forever. So long, blowjob world, I thought. I'm the guy with the metal finger in his nose. And right when I realized that, the phone vibrated in my pocket. Time to split for the tavern, I thought. I moped away out of the store and onto the 6th Avenue sidewalk. It was tough getting to my shift at the tavern that night. Tough because I had to avoid introspecting. Usually I'm pretty good at avoiding the inward glance, but I definitely need props to help me with that. Like, 
loud music, and earbuds, or the confidence that somebody really hot will want to show me ass cleavage over the top of her jeans sometime soon. And I didn't have either of those things that night. And that last thing, the confidence that some hot babe would want to show me ass cleavage over the top of her jeans sometime soon, I was pretty sure I would never have that again. So introspection was something I absolutely positively had to avoid somehow. Right after I wrote that last sentence, I went to my medicine cabinet and shook a few tablets of Paxamander into my palm and gulped them down. Want to relax fast? Ask your doctor about Paxamander. The commercial voiceover says while a middle-aged balding man with a gut laughs and blows out candles on his birthday cake. So right now while I'm writing this, failure's familiar. I mean, who cares? Metal schmetal. Finger schminger. I'm on Paxamander. But if you haven't got any drugs on you, introspecting is just a parking lot full of rattlesnakes, and I didn't have any drugs back on the night I was evicted from Blowjob World. I took the walk down 6th and then across to Broadway to get to my shift. That's when I was most in danger of slipping into the depression death spiral. That's what Jessica calls it when she's writing the prescription, only she leaves out the word death. This, scribble scribble, is to keep you from slipping into the spiral. Tear, smile, and now I have a license to buy a bunch of spiral killers. So what did I have going for me? What could I tally on the net positive side of my life? Well, I was still married, and I could slam the wife on her schedule. But what kind of life is that? That's how the old spiral works. You fail at something. You feel like a tooth-scarred chew toy even the dog ignores. So you immediately take stock of all your prospects and of all the things you've succeeded at. That's when you remember you have no prospects and you've succeeded at jack shit. Now you feel even lower than you did before. Now it's anybody's guess what you'll do with your brain. But unless you suddenly remember you're a movie star and you found a refugee family on a raft and they think you're a demigod for picking them up on your yacht, chances are your brain is going to take you down the path through the dark forest of failure that leads all the way back to the little girl who wouldn't kiss you in the fourth grade no matter how many candy canes you gave her out of your own stocking. So down you go! Until depression turns into panic and you freak out and end up one of those people who can't catch their breath and think they're having a heart attack. That's the verge I was on as I scuttled across the city to the bar at Irish Tavern number 37, Manhattan Division. Notes from the Upper West Side is a work of fiction. The people depicted in this work do not exist. Notes from the Upper West Side. Copyright 2024 by Dan Wrench.